So our scripture reading is Romans chapter 9 from verse 19 to the end of the chapter. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who is not beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans are among the most disputed passages of Scripture in the Bible. And the reason is that in these chapters, Paul deals with two main issues over which there's been much debate over the years. The issue of Israel and the issue of God's sovereignty. Two weeks ago, we ended with Paul's statement in verse 18, when he says, So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And having just said that, Paul anticipates another objection which might be made by his readers. So he writes in the next verse we picked up this morning, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? A way of paraphrasing that is to say that if salvation is the sole work of God, then what right does God have to condemn those who are not saved? Now, this is a common objection to the teaching of the sovereign will of God, particularly when it comes to the subject of his elect and the doctrine of predestination. However, we need to remember that we do not have a complete understanding of the nature of God. Our understanding of God is limited in many ways, but there are two main ways in which our understanding or our grasp of him is, is, is limited. Firstly, in accordance with his sovereign will, God has chosen not to reveal himself fully to us. Although we are given enough of understanding of, of him and his nature in order to know how we can be saved, we're able to understand the gospel message. And secondly, our understanding of God is tainted by our sinful nature. In our fallen state, we are self-centered. And we've all bought into this lie that this life is about us and about what we want. I was sharing with our Bible study group last week that while most of us become more polite as we grow older, the question we continue to ask throughout our lives is, what about me? So again, we need to be very careful about accusing God of being unfair and unjust. If sinners did receive justice, we would all be in hell. Now, of course, no one likes to hear that truth in, in our what-about-me world today. But it remains the truth nonetheless. The good news of the gospel is that God has chosen to give divine, sovereign grace in the lives of some. So who are we to question his authority or his right to do so? Paul puts it very bluntly in verse 20 when he asks, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? And we would do very well to remember the example of Job. In Job 38 verse 2, God asks him, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? 
And he then, he then goes on the, in the next three chapters to ask Job more than 80 questions, all of which are of, with, with much the same theme as Paul's question in Romans 9 verse 20. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Now, Job eventually had the wisdom and the humility to recognize that he had no authority over God, nor did he have any right to question the sovereignty of God. And we can learn a lot from Job. This is, in, in chapter 42, the final chapter of Job, this is his response after being grilled for the previous three chapters. Then Job answered the Lord and said, now he's quoting the question that God first asked him, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Then again he quotes God when he says, Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. That was the challenge God made to him. And Job's response is, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. In Romans 9, Paul uses the example of how a potter has power over his clay to make of it what he wants. And he uses the same analogy which we see in Jeremiah chapter 18 by arguing that not only is it irrational, but in fact it's arrogant for sinful men to question God's sovereign will. God is sovereign and he has supreme power over his creation. This gives him the right to do with it as pleases him. He doesn't have to ask, he doesn't have to answer to us or explain himself to us. The truth is that God owes us nothing other than damnation. But in his grace and in his mercy, he has chosen a people for himself. He is sovereign and he does as he pleases. He does not ask our permission, nor does he seek our opinion. God is the one who created us for his own purposes, and we owe our entire existence to him. And his unique position of creator brings with it a divine prerogative to accomplish his purposes with his creation as he sees fit. As his creation, our role is to trust, not to like or dislike his plans. If God chooses to call some to salvation and to leave others in their rebellion to face the, the consequences, that's his right, that's his prerogative. And there's an important point that we need to consider here. God does not create people to damn them. And Paul goes into detail on this and explains it in verse 22. He says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In the King James Version, it speaks of vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And what Paul is doing here. He, he, he places the blame for destruction fairly and squarely on the shoulders of the sinner and not on God. This phrase, fitted to destruction, implies that the vessels themselves choose to be prepared for destruction. They are prepared for destruction by their own sin, their disobedience and rebellion, not by some random decree of God. Because sinners refuse to repent of their sins, and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation, it is their choice if they perish. God does not make men sinful, but he leaves them in the sin they have chosen. And Paul in verse 22 also talks of how God endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. By withholding his judgment, he is showing grace even to those who remain under his wrath. Now, God could easily and quite justifiably destroy sinners the first time they sinned. But as he did with Adam and Eve, so he patiently endures the rebellion of sinners rather than giving them what every sin immediately deserves, which is eternal punishment. And as we continue to live under grace, we are given the opportunity to repent. As Paul writes in Romans 2 verse 4, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? There's an American theologian by the name of Charles Erdman who died in the 1980s. 
And he wrote this. God's sovereignty is never exercised in condemning men who ought to be saved. But rather, it has resulted in the salvation of men who ought to be lost. And we need to get that into our heads when it comes to trying to understand God's sovereignty and the way that he chooses his elect. He continues, he says, God does not prepare vessels of wrath for destruction, but he does prepare, pre prepare vessels of mercy for glory. And Paul makes a sweeping statement in verses 22 through to 24, which in the English Standard Version, King James and the New King James Version, is actually all in one sentence. He says, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not, only from, the, not, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. There's that important phrase there, prepared beforehand for glory. The point is that God not only shows his glory by saving his elect, but he receives as much glory by displaying his wrath and his righteous anger at the unrepentant. Now, most of us find it hard, if not impossible, to accept such a truth. But just think about this for a moment. God is absolute in his majesty, his holiness, his mercy, his grace, his justice, his wrath and his fury at sin. He is perfect in all of those things. God is glorious in every facet of his nature. And he does nothing which is contrary to his nature. And included in this list is his wrath towards unrepentant sinners and his punishment of them. There are some extremely hard truths in Romans chapter 9. Which is why Romans 9 through 11 have created so much debate and conflict down the years. But as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture, including the verses that we haven't underlined in our Bibles. So yes, God receives as much glory from displaying his wrath as he does by demonstrating his grace to his elect. Now, to the sinful mind, this seems like such a contradiction. And that word unfair kind of pops into our minds again. But this merely confirms the reality that we will never be able to grasp all of the aspects of God's grace and sovereignty. He says to the prophet Isaiah, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, my ways, your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yet he shows grace and mercy. Have a look at Psalm 103 from verses 8 to 12. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Instead of questioning God and his motives, we should instead be grateful that he has not dealt with us according to our sins or repaid us according to our iniquities. Because if he did, we would receive nothing but his wrath. The wages of sin is death eternal death, because we have sinned against the eternal God. And the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And if we die in our sins, we will rightly and justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. That's what I deserve. That is what you deserve. Instead, in our world today, we keep hearing these calls for justice in every aspect of society. It's all about my rights and what I want and what I need. What about me is all we hear. But trust me, you don't want justice. You don't want justice because if you did, all we would get would be hell. 
The mere fact that God has chosen to show mercy to some is enough reason for us to be thankful that he has chosen us to be objects of his grace. And instead we cry out that he's being unfair. There's no real polite way to put this, but just who do we think we are to accuse God of being unfair or being unjust? How dare we, sinners who have rejected God, even think of questioning him? And his sovereign will. Now these are hard truths. And they're offensive to the sinful mind. But they remain the truth. And we need to pray that God would grant us the faith and the wisdom to see that. Remember we don't know who God's elect are. You will know that you are one of his elect. When you feel him drawing you to himself. As your heart accepts the truth of the gospel. But our task then is to proclaim that same gospel to a lost and a dying world. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. And the instrument that God uses to draw his elect to himself is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And As we've seen and heard many times, we will never fully understand God and his ways. When a sinner tries to understand the mind of God, we will always fall woefully short. But what we can do is accept the word of God by faith at face value and trust him to do the calling, the convicting and the saving. Paul further illustrates the sovereignty of God by, by, the sovereignty of God by quoting from the prophets Hosea and Isaiah. Now again, this didn't sit well with his Jewish readers. Those who thought they had some divine right to salvation, purely because of their birthright. And there are some who believe and even teach that all of Israel will be saved. But there are two major issues with this false teaching. Firstly, it directly opposes scripture. And secondly, it stands in direct opposition to the gospel. Faith in Christ alone is what brings salvation, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. And not only are many biological descendants of Abraham excluded from the elect who receive mercy, but the elect also includes Gentiles who believe, people who once were not God's people. Yet despite Israel's widespread unbelief and, and rebellion against him, God promises to preserve a remnant for salvation among ethnic Israel. He says, as indeed he says in Hosea, those are, these are speaking of the Gentiles. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And who who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Those are the Gentiles that God has chosen. And he continues. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Those verses in particular stand against those who say, well, all of Israel will be saved because they're God's chosen people. That's not what scripture tells us. And as Paul quotes Hosea and Isaiah, he again emphasizes that were it not for the pure, simple grace of God, no one would be saved. We mustn't forget that because of the original sin passed down to us, we are born with this death sentence hanging over us. But it is the undeserved grace of God offered to us which saves. It's the grace of God which intervenes and calls sinners to salvation whether they be Jews or Gentiles. And this is Paul's closing argument in chapter 9. Listen very carefully to how Paul draws his readers from making this distinction between the saved and the lost. He draws them away from the issue of birthright to what really matters. What really matters is faith in Jesus Christ and being clothed in his righteousness. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness, righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. 
The righteousness which is necessary for salvation is given exclusively to those who believe the gospel message and on nothing else. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So how can it be then that some Gentiles who did not know God receive salvation, while at the same time some Jews who knew his word are not, are not receive, did not receive salvation? Why is that? By divine sovereignty. God's choice. God's prerogative. When the gospel of Jesus Christ was, was preached to the Gentiles, they were convicted of their sin and turned to Christ by faith. Many of the Jews who saw themselves as righteous already did not repent of their sins and turn to Christ. But all who come to him by faith in the gospel message are declared perfectly righteous by God. You see, the key is Jesus Christ. It always has been and always will be. It is all dependent on the finished work of Jesus on the cross and nothing else. So when Paul asks this question, why, in verse 32, he's asking on behalf of the Jews, why have so many missed out on salvation? And the answer that he gives is because they wanted to please God by their own righteous works. But that will never do. And then chapter 9 closes with Paul quoting from Isaiah 28 and Psalm 118. And he says, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Divine sovereignty and human guilt are what Paul focuses on here. By God's grace and his sovereignty, Gentiles who did not seek God's righteousness have now received it through faith in Jesus Christ. But Israel as a people, as a nation, has failed to receive it because they mistakenly believed that they had a legal right to righteousness. To those Jews seeking to establish their own righteousness on the basis of the law, Jesus Christ is the stumbling stone. Salvation only comes to those who respond to the call of God by faith. The problem with the Jews was that they simply could not see how Jesus, a man who was crucified, thus making him cursed, how he could ever be their saviour. And this is what Paul meant by likening Jesus to a stumbling stone and a rock of offence. The gospel has always been offensive in the sinful world. But those who understand that they are sinners and that Jesus died for their sins don't stumble over this truth. Instead, they fall down before the cross and are saved. And as Paul continues into, into chapter 10, which we'll come to next week, he reinforces his teaching that it is the gospel alone which has power to save. And I want to close with what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, the gospel, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Shall we pray? Lord, this whole concept of your sovereignty and your absolute will, it continues to challenge the sinful mind. And we confess, Father, that particularly when we read passages of Scripture like Romans chapter 9, that we are challenged. But as Paul said in verse 20, who are we to talk back to God? And Father, we pray that you would forgive us for the times when we have questioned your sovereign will and your right to do with your creation as you have chosen. At the same time, Lord, we give you thanks for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen your elect, that you have chosen a remnant for yourself.
We thank you, Lord, that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, and you have not repaid us according to our iniquities. Instead, you have shown your amazing grace to those that you have chosen, even those who are still in rebellion against you. Your common grace is shown to them too. And so, Lord, we pray that you grant us humility and faith to accept your word at, at face value, in particular the passages of Scripture which we struggle with, those that we find hard to accept. Above all, Lord, we thank you for the gospel, which is the power to save. And we give you honor, praise, and glory. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.